Thank you, everybody. I don't know how competent I am, but I can speak. So I think it's really interesting and fortuitous that I am back in Houston, Texas, because it was nine years ago, this coming June, that I found myself at a press conference on behalf of a death row inmate by the name of Gary Graham. I was asked to come to Houston, Texas to tell my story, um, to lend a face, some credence to um, what happens when mistakes are made and how these mistakes are made, and then what is the damage and the fallout from it. And I came down here very nervous, not knowing what in the world I was going to say and how I was going to say it and who wanted to hear me anyway. But it did lead to what I have been trying to do for the last nine years, and that is to go across the country and up into the far reaches of Canada to tell my story, um, my story which started 25 years ago in July of 1984 as a young college student. I was 22 at Elon College in Burlington, North Carolina. And as most of you and most of the exonerees in here, you had your life kind of figured out. You'd pl you had a plan. You had goals. I mean, you knew what you wanted to do with your life. And I had decided I wanted to graduate in the top of my class with a straight A 4.0 GPA. That was my plan. I wanted to get married to the guy I was dating. We had been talking about it and planning it, and that was my goal. That was my plan. I lived alone in my apartment, worked two jobs, and worked really hard, and that was my goal, and that was my plan. And like the exonerees in here, one day your life is just derailed. It's like a train wreck. You're going in one direction, and something happens. Something, some force takes place, and your life is not what you had planned it to be. And that happened for me in the early morning hours of July 29th as I was sleeping in my bed. I felt a presence in my bedroom that morning. I was on the edge of sleep and being awake and felt that there was someone in my room and thought I heard someone moving around and actually felt something brush up against my arm and as I turned to the left side of my bed, I noticed there was a head, someone's head crouched beside my mattress. At that moment, I yelled. I said, who is it? Who's there? And at that point, someone jumped on my bed, put a knife to my throat, and as I screamed, he muffled my mouth with a gloved hand. Now, again, I say that I was a 4.0 GPA student. Studying was really um, very key to me. I, um, I knew... Um, how to pay attention to details. I knew um, how, to, how, to, how to look and, and be very thoughtful. And as I struggled to um, figure out if I was going to live or die, and these moments went very quickly in my mind, I realized that I was unarmed. Um, I realized that I was a small woman and I probably was not going to be able to physically defend myself. And therefore, I made the decision that night that I would try to stay very focused and very calm and hope that somehow I survived. Throughout the uh, rape, I paid attention to his face. I knew what the police were going to ask me, should I live. They were going to ask me how tall this man was. How much did he weigh? About how old was he, Jennifer? Did you get any identifying features? Did he have any tattoos or scars? Maybe a piercing, something, anything that could Led, lead, led them, lead them to um, apprehending this monster and taking him off the streets. So I did. I paid very close attention that night as he raped me. He began to tell me certain things like, I know you can't see me because you're not wearing your glasses. I know you're from that town where they burn witches. And he got Winston-Salem and Salem, Massachusetts confused. It became clear to me that he had actually been in my apartment for quite some time. He knew me. He'd invaded my privacy, he'd invaded my home, and now he was invading my body. And to say that I hated this man would be a complete understatement. If I had had a weapon, I would have killed him. And I would have killed him with a smile on my face that night. During the rape, at one point, he tried to kiss me. And I can remember being so disgusted. And I turned my head to the side, and he said, relax, I'm not going to hurt you. My father often says that there is no such thing as luck, that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. 
And for some reason, when he said that to me, I knew that that was my opportunity. I had to get him off of me. And I said, I'm really afraid of knives. If you'll get off of me and take the knife and walk down the front of my apartment and drop the knife on my car, I'll let you come back in. And he believed me. I wrapped a blanket around myself because I knew that it would be important for me to stand very close to him to figure out how tall he was in comparison to my small five foot one frame. I needed to know like where his hands might hit his hips. Perhaps his feet were splayed a certain way. What kind of shoes was he wearing? How much did he weigh? Important details. I needed to know. He didn't go down to my car. He simply walked to my front door pretended to drop the knife out and came back in and grabbed my arms and said, let's go. And I said, um, I have to go to the bathroom because I knew I couldn't go back in that room. I knew that he would have to kill me first. I went into the bathroom, and as I went into the bathroom, I remember turning the light on and taking a look at him just briefly, momentary glimpses. This would be important later on. I knew that. I knew that. And he quickly said, turn the light off. And as I went into the bathroom, I began to pray. I said, God, I, I don't know how to get out of this. I'm not sure if I even can. And then I remembered he had told me he had come through my back door. I needed to get to the back door. I knew his way in would be my way out. As I went out of the bathroom, again, he said, let's go. And I said, well, I'm really thirsty. Um, can I make a drink of water for myself? And he said, yeah, and make me one too, and we'll have a party. I went into the kitchen, and I quickly turned the light on. Again, light became my friend that night. Light would keep him away from me. It would give me that distance, that space. Maybe two seconds, maybe 15 feet, but it might just be enough that I could run. And as I began to make noise in the kitchen with water and ice and drawers and cabinets, I prayed, and I ran. And he quickly came after me. I saw him behind me. It had started to rain now. I didn't know where I was going. I had no plan. I was simply wrapped in a blanket, running for my life. I knew that if he caught me, I was dead. I knew that. I ran to the light. The light was my friend. I ran to a carport. I had no idea who lived there. I just prayed that someone was home. And as I went to the door and I began to bang and make noise, the man came around the corner, the father of the house, and he looked at me and I said, please let me in. I've just been raped and he's after me. And he did what I think I would have done, which is stand there and scream. And fortunately, his wife came around the corner and she was a professor at the college. She had seen me for a year and a half walking back and forth to school and she said, my God, it's a student at the college, let her in. And as I opened the door and I walked in, I fainted. The next thing at noon, they had called 911. I could hear the police. They had dogs try to chase them, but it was raining. They lost his scent rather quickly. And they asked me, did you get a good look at the man who did this to you? And I said, yes, I did. I did. 21, 22, 23 years old. Um, young African-American man, light-skinned, um, about six feet tall, maybe around 175, 180 pounds. He was wearing a navy blue shirt with white stripes on the sleeves. He had on khaki pants and boat shoes. I know what he looks like. I knew what he looked like. I went to the hospital. My body had now become evidence. As I began to do the rape kit, it was a horror as they began to collect biological evidence from my body. As I laid in the hospital room, I heard a woman crying. She wasn't far from where I was, but I recognized her cry. It was a deep, guttural, death cry. And I remember asking the detective, the woman that's crying, what happened to her, and he said, she's just been raped. We think it's the same man who just raped you. I couldn't believe it. I was stunned. I mean, hate was palatable. I, I could taste it. This monster had broken into our lives and within an hour had destroyed two women. 